Good evening, this is Pamela, and you're listening to Watchmen on the Pod. We are going to begin, believe it or not, finally, back again in The 50 Years in the Church of Rome by Charles Chinaquart. I've taken a break from it, read other books, actually finished other books too. Now it's time, prompted by the Lord, to get back into this book, and we need to finish it also. It will be a while, though, because there's 665 pages to this book, and I'm only on 219. All right, here we go with chapter 29. Out of the Church of Rome there is no salvation. It's one of the doctrines which the priests in Rome have to believe and teach to the people. That dogma, once accepted, caused me to devote all my energies to the conversion of Protestants prevent one of those immortal and precious souls from going to he- going into hell seemed to be more important and glorious than the conquest of a kingdom. In view of showing them their errors, I filled my library with the best controversial books which could be got in Quebec, and I studied the Holy Scriptures with the utmost attention. In the Marine Hospital, as well as in my intercourse with the people of the city, I had several meetings of be- of several occasions of meeting Protestants and talking to them. But I found at once that, with very few exceptions, they avoided speaking with me on religion. This distressed me. Having been told one day that the Reverend Mr. Anthony Parent, superior of the seminary Quebec, had converted several hundred Protestants during his long ministry, I went to ask him if this were true. For answer, he showed me the list of his converts, which numbered more than 200, among whom were some of the most respectable English and Scottish families of the city. I looked upon that list with amazement, and from that day I considered him the most blessed priest of Canada. He was a perfect gentleman in his manners, and was considered one of our best champion on all points of controversy with the Protestants. He could have been classed along also among the handsomest men in his time, had he not been so fat. But when the high classes called him by the respectable name of Mr. Superior of the Seminary, the common people used to name him Pierre uh, Cacassier, cockfighting father, on account of his long-cherished habit of having the bravest and strongest fighting cocks of the country. <clears throat> in vain had the Reverend Mr. Ranavos, curate of the good St. Anne, that greatest miracle-working saint of Canada, expended fabulous sums of money in ransacking the whole country to get a cock who would take away the palm of victory from the hands of the superior of the seminary of Quebec. He had almost invariably failed. With very few exceptions, his cock had fallen bruised, bleeding, and dead on many battlefields, chosen by those two priests. However, I feel happy in acknowledging that, since the terrible epidemic of cholera, that cruel and ignominious passe pimps has been entirely given up by the Roman Catholic clergy of this country. Playing cards and checkers is now the most usual way the majority of curates and vicars have recourse to spend their long and many idle hours, both of the week and Sabbath days. After reading over and over again that long list of converts, I said to Mr. Parent, Please tell me how you have been able to persuade these Protestant converts to consent to speak with you on the errors of their religion. Many times I have tried to show the Protestants whom I met that they would be lost if they did not submit to our holy church. But with few exceptions, they laughed at me as politely as possible and turned the conversation to other matters. You must have some secret way of attracting their attention and winning their confidence. Would you not be kind enough to give me that secret that I may be able also to prevent some of those precious souls from perishing? You are right when you think that I have a secret to open the doors of the Protestants and conquer and tame their haughty minds, answered Mr. Pirrett. But that secret is of such a delicate nature that I have never revealed it to anyone except my confessor. Nevertheless, I see that you are so in earnest for the conversion of Protestants that I have such a confidence in your discretion and honor 
that for the sake of our holy church, I consent to give you my secret. Only you must promise that you will never reveal it during my lifetime to anybody. Even after my death, you will not mention it, except when you are sure it is the greatest glory of God. You know that I was the most intimate friend your father ever had. I had no secret from him. He had none from me. But God knows that the friendly feelings and the confidence I had in him are now bestowed upon you, his worthy son. If you had and not in my heart the esteem and high position your father occupied, I would not trust you with my secret. He then continued, The majority of Protestants in Quebec have Irish Roman Catholic servant girls. These, particularly before the last few years, used to come to confess to me, as I was almost the only priest who spoke English. The first thing I used to ask them when they were confessing was if their masters and mistresses were truly devoted and pious Protestants, or if they were indifferent and cold in performing their duties. The second thing I wanted to know was if they were on good terms with their ministers, whether or not they were, were visited by them. From the answers of the girls, I knew both the moral and immoral, the religious or the irreligious habits of their masters as perfectly as if I had been an inmate of their households. It is thus that I learned that many Protestants have no more religion and faith than our dogs. They awake in the morning and go to bed at night without praying to God any more than the horses in their stables. Many of them go to church on the Sabbath day more to laugh at their ministers and criticize their sermons than anything else. A part of the week is passed in turning them into ridicule. Nay, through the confessions of these honest girls, I learn that many Protestants like the fine ceremonies of our church. They often favorably contrasted them with the cold performances of their own and expressed their views in glowing terms about the, spirit, the superiority of our educational institutions, nunneries, etc. over their own high schools or colleges. Besides, you know that a great number of our most respected and wealthy Protestants trust their daughters to our good nuns for their education. I took notes of all these things and formed my plans of battle against Protestantism. As a general who knows his ground and weak points of his adversaries, I fought as a man who was sure of an easy victory. The glorious result you have under your eyes is the proof that I was correct in my plans. My first step with the Protestants, whom I knew to be without any religion or even already well disposed toward us, was to go to them with sometimes five dollars or even twenty-five when I presented to them as being theirs. <clears throat> they first, they at first looked at me with amazement as a being coming from a superior world. The following conversation then almost invariably took place between them and me. Are you positive, sir, that this money is mine? Yes, sir, I answered. I am certain that this money is yours. But they replied, please tell me how you know that it belongs to me. It is the first time I have the honor of talking with you, and we are perfect strangers to each other. I answered, I cannot say, sir, how I know that this money is yours, except by telling you that the person who deposited it in my hand for you has given me your name and your address so correctly that there is no possibility of any mistake. But can I not know the name of the person who has put that money into your hands for me? Rejoined the Protestant. No, sir. The secret of confession is inviolable. I replied, we have no example that is that has ever been broken. I, with every priest in our church, would prefer to die rather than betray our penitence and reveal their confession. We cannot even act from what we have learned through their confession except at their own request. But this ocular confession must then be a most admirable thing, admit, added the Protestant. I had no idea of it before this day. Yes, sir, ocular confession is a most admirable thing, I used to reply, because it is a divine institution. But, sir, please excuse me. My ministry calls me to another place. I must take leave of you to go where my duty calls. I am very sorry that you go so quickly, generally answered the Protestant. Can I have another visit from you? Please do the honor of coming again. I would be so happy to present you to my wife, and I know she would be happy also, and much honored to make your acquaintance. 
Yes, sir, I accept with gratitude your invitation. I feel much pleased and honored to make the acquaintance of the family of a gentleman whose praises are in the mouth of everyone and whose industry and honesty are an honor to our city. If you allow me, next week at the same hour, I will have the honor of presenting my respectful homage to your lady. The very next day, all the papers reported that Mr. So-and-so had received five or ten or even twenty-five dollars as a restitution through arcular confession, and even the staunch Protestant editors of those papers could not find words sufficiently eloquent to praise me and our sacrament of penance. <clears throat> Three or four days later, I was sure that the faithful servant girls were in the confessional box, glowing with joy to tell me that now their masters and mistresses could not speak of anything else than the amiability of the honesty of the priests of Rome. They raised them a thousand miles over the heads of their own ministers. From those pious girls, they invariably learned that they had not been visited by a single friend without making the elogium of Arakler confession, and even sometimes expressing the regret that the reformers had swept away such a useful institution. Now, my dear young friend, you see how, by the blessing of God, the little sacrifice of a few pounds brought down and destroyed all the prejudices of those poor heretics against the oracular ar confession and our holy church in general. You understand how the doors were open to me and how their hearts and intelligence were like fields prepared to receive the good seed. At the appointed hour, I never failed from paying the requested visit and I was invariably received like the Messiah. Not only the gentlemen, but the ladies overwhelmed me with marks of the most sincere gratitude and respect. Even the dear little children petted me and threw their arms around my neck to give their sweetly angelic kisses. The only topic on which we could speak, of course, was the great good done by arcular confession. I easily showed them how it works, how it words as a check to all the evil passions of the heart, how it is admirably adapted to all the wants of the poor sinners who find a friend, a counselor, a guide, a father, a real savior in their confessor. We had not talked half an hour in that way when it was generally evident to me that they were more than halfway out of their Protestant errors. I very seldom left their houses without being sure of a new glorious victory for our holy religion over its enemies. It is very seldom that I do not succeed in bringing that family to our holy church before one or two years, and if I fail from gaining the father or mother, I am nearly sure to persuade them to send their daughters to our good nuns and their boys to our colleges where they sooner or later become our most devoted Catholic. So you see that the few dollars I spent every year for that holy cause are the best investments ever made. They do more to catch the Protestants of Quebec than the baits of the fishermen do to secure the codfishes of the Newfoundland banks. In ending this last sentence, Mr. Parent filled his room with laughter. I thanked him for these interesting details, but I told him, though I cannot but admire your perfect skill and shrewdness in breaking the barriers which prevent Protestants from understanding the divine institution of arcular confession, will you allow me to ask you if you do not fear to be guilty of an imposture and a gross imposition in the way you make them believe that the money you had, they, the money that you had them has come to you through arcular confession? I have not the least the fear of that, promptly answered the old priest, for the good reason that if you had paid attention to what I had told you, you must acknowledge that I have not said positively that the money was coming from arcular confession. If those Protestants have been deceived, it is only due to their own want of a more perfect attention to what I said. I know that there were things that kept in, that I kept in my mind which would have made them understand the matter in a very different way. If I had said to them, but Ligori and all our theologians among the most approved of our holy church tell us that these reservations of the mind, mentis reservationists, are allowed when they are for the good of souls and the glory of God. Yes, I answered. <clears throat> I know that such is the doctrine of Ligori, and it is approved by the Pope. I must confess that this seems to me entirely opposed to what we read in the sublime gospel. The simple and sublime 
yea, yea, and nay, nay, of our Savior seems to me in contradiction with the art of deceiving, even when not saying absolute and direct falsehood. And if I submit myself to those doctrines, it is always with a secret protest in my inmost soul. In an angry manner, Mr. Parent replied, Now, my dear young friend, I understand the truth of what the Reverend Nasser Perez and Bedard told me lately about you. Though these remarkable priests are full of esteem for you, they see a dark cloud on your horizon. They say that you spend too much time in reading the Bible, and not enough in studying the doctrines and holy traditions of the Church. You are too much inclined also to interpret the word of God according to your own fallible intelligence, instead of going to the church alone for that interpretation. That is the dangerous rock on which Luther and Calvin were wrecked. Take my advice. Do not try to be wiser than the church. Obey her voice when she speaks to you through her holy theologians. This is your only safeguard. The bishop would suspend you at once were he aware of your want of faith in the church. These last words were said with such emphasis that they seemed more like the sentence of condemnation from the lips of an irritated judge than anything else. I felt that I had again seriously compromised myself in his mind, and the only way of preventing him from denouncing me to the bishop as a heretic and a Protestant was to make an apology and withdraw from the dangerous grounds on which I had again so imprudently put myself. He accepted my explanation, but I saw that he bitterly regretted having trusted me with his secret. I withdrew from his presence, much humiliated by my want of prudence and wisdom. However, though I could not approve of all the modus operandi of the superior of Quebec, I could not but admire the glorious results of his effort in converting Protestants, and I took the resolution of devoting myself more than ever to show them their errors and make them good Catholics. In this, I was too successful for during my 25 years of priesthood, I had persuaded 93 Protestants to give up their gospel, light, and truth in order to follow the dark and lying traditions of Rome. I cannot enter into the details of their conversions, or rather perversions, suffice it to say that I soon found that my only chance of success in that proselytizing work was among the ritualists. I saw at first that Calvin and Knox had a dug a really impassable abyss between the Presbyterians, Methodists, Baptists, and the Church of Rome. If these ritualists remain Protestants and do not make the very short step which separates them from Rome, it is a most astonishing fact that they are logical men. Some people are surprised that so many eminent and learned men in Great Britain and America give up their Protestantism to submit to the Church of Rome. But my wonder is that there are so very few among them who fall into that bottomless abyss of idolatry and folly when they are their whole life on the very brink of the chasm. Put millions of men on the very brink of the falls of Niagara, force them to cross to and from in small canoes between both shores, and you will see that every day some of them will be dragged in spite of themselves into the yawning abyss. Nay, you will see that sooner or later those millions of people will be in danger of being dragged in a whole body by the irresistible force of the dashing waters into the fathomless gulf. Through a sublime effort, the English people, helped by the mighty and merciful hand of God, has come out from the abyss of folly and impurity, ignorance, slavery, and idolatry, called the Church of Rome. But many, alas, in the present day, instead of marching up to the high regions of unsullied gospel truth and light, instead of going up to the high mountains where true Christians' simplicity and liberty have forever planted their glorious banners, have been induced to walk only a few steps out of the pestiferous regions of popery. They have remained so near the pestilential atmosphere of the stagnant waters of death which flow from Rome that the atmosphere they breathe is still filled with the deadly emanations of that modern Sodom who, without shedding tears of sorrow, can look at those misguided ministers of the gospel who believe and teach in the Episcopal Church that they have the power to make their God with a wafer and bow down before that wafer God and adore him, 
Who can refrain from indignation at the sight of so many Episcopal ministers who consent to have their ears, minds, and souls polluted at the confessional by the stories of their penitents, whom in their turn they destroy by their infamous and unmentionable questions? When I was lecturing in England in 1860, the late Archbishop of Canterbury, then Bishop of London, invited me to his table in company with Reverend Mr. Thomas, now Bishop of Goulburn, Australia, and put to me the following questions in the presence of his numerous and noble guests. Father China Kwai, when you left the Church of Rome, why did you not join the Episcopalian rather than the Presbyterian Church? I answered, it is the desire of your lordship that I should speak my mind on that delicate subject. Yes, yes, said the noble lord bishop. Then, my lord, I must tell you that my only reason is that I find in your church several doctrines which I have to condemn in the church of Rome. How is that, replied the lordship. Please, I answered, let me have one of your common prayer books. Taking the book, I read slowly the article on the visitation of the sick. Here shall the sick person be moved to make a special confession of his, say, his sins, if he feels his conscience troubled with any weightier matter. After which confession the priest shall absolve him if he humbly and heartily desires it after his sort. After this sort, our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath power to His church, who has left power to His church to absolve all sinner who repent and believe in him of his great mercy forgive the thine offenses and by his authority committed to me i absolve thee from all thy sin in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy ghost amen i then added my lord where is the difference between the errors of rome and your church on this subject the difference is very great he answered the church of rome is constantly pressing sinners to come to their priest, to come to her priest all their lifetime, when we subject the sinner to his humiliation only once in his life, when he is near his last hour. Hmm. Weird. <clears throat> but my Lord, let me tell you that it seems to me the Church of Rome is more, than, more logical and con consistent in this than the Episcopal Church. Both churches believe and teach they have received from Christ the power to forgive the sons of those who confess to their priests. And you think yourself wiser because you invite the sinner to confess and receive his pardon only when he is tied to a bed of suffering at the last hour before his death. But will your lordship be kind enough to tell me when I am in danger of death? If I am constantly in danger of death, must you not, with the Church of Rome, endorse me constantly to confess to your priests and get my pardon and make my peace with God? Has our Savior said anywhere that it was only for the dying at the last extremity of life that he gave the power to forgive sin? Has he not warned me every many times to always be ready to have always our peace made with God and not to wait till the last day, the last hour? The noble bishop did not think fit to give me any other answer than these very words. We all agree that this doctrine ought never to have been put in common prayer book, but you know that we at work to re that we are at work to revise that book, and we hope that this clause with other several others will be taken away. Then I answered in a Joseph's way, My lord, when this obnoxious clause has been removed from your common prayer book, it will be time for me to have the honor belonging to your great and noble church. When the Church of Rome went out of the Church of Rome, I'm sorry, when the Church of England went out of the Church of Rome, she did as Rachel, the wife of Jacob, who left the house of her father Laban and took his gods with her. So the Episcopal Church of England, unfortunately, when she left Rome, concealed in the folds of her mantle some of the false gods of Rome. She kept to her bosom some vipers engendered in the marshes of the modern Sodom. Those vipers, if not soon destroyed, will kill her. They are already eating up her vitals. They are covering her with most ugly and mortal wounds. They are rapidly taking away her life. May the Holy Ghost rebaptize and pure 
purify those noble church of England, that she may be worthy to march at the head of the armies of the Lord to the conquest of the world under the banners of the great captain of our salvation. That was very interesting. Interesting, to say the least. I didn't know all that before. Huh. Well, brothers and sisters, that ends chapter 29. I kind of want to keep going, but I can't. I got to take it slow, but that is very interesting. I did not know that about the Episcopal, Episcopalian or however you say that. I didn't know that about that church. Very interesting. All right. Well, brothers and sisters, as always, take this to the Lord in prayer. Search these things out for yourself. Be a Berean, please. Be a noble Berean. And uh, search the scriptures to make sure that these things are so. Look to the Lord. Keep your eyes on Jesus, brothers and sisters. And your nose in the book, which is the word of God. And embed the word of God upon the tablets of your heart. So you will not sin against God or be deceived. Until next time, I love you all so very much. Bye-bye.